Welcome to the 48th session of our New Testament series. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we're going to be talking about the book of Revelation. And the first thing I would like to point out, I want to point out, is that it's the book of Revelation, not Revelations. And so very often someone will say, let's go to the book of Revelations. It's one revelation. And it takes all this book to tell us about that one revelation the revelation of God dealing with the people, suffering people. And so that's what the book is about, the book of Revelation. Also, in the book, we have what is called apocalyptic writing. Apocalyptic writing, it's a form of writing literature that was found about 200 years before Christ and about 100 or more years after Christ. It was used occasionally by different authors to speak about symbolic events that were going to happen, but they're not meant to be taken literally. They're meant to be seen as something that is really drawing out our mind, and we look under the symbol. It's used in the Old Testament, for instance, in the book of Ezekiel, the book of Zechariah. We find it strongly in Daniel. And so we find it in those books in the Old Testament, and then we come into the New Testament. Occasionally, we'll find apocalyptic writings, perhaps in a chapter of one of the Gospels. But this book is totally a book of revelation, very often called the Apocalypse. So the apocalyptic writing, highly symbolic. It's not meant to be taken literally. We've seen many difficulties down through the ages of preachers or others who have taken the book literally and have made applications that were never meant to be made from this book, especially when it talks about the end times. The book of Revelation, it's not centered mainly on the end times. It talks about that. But there are other ideas that really come into play about being able to live and be faithful to Christ. So the book of Revelation in that sense. As we go through the book, I'll be explaining different sections and explaining the symbolism of some of the writings that are found here. So it begins, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show this, his servants what must happen soon. The book of Revelation does not foretell what's going to happen way down in history. It tells really how people ought to cope with their life at the time the book was written. Apocalyptic writings such as this, for instance, when it talks about future events, it's really talking about events that have already taken place. The author makes believe he lives previous to what he is writing about. So whenever there is something historical found in the book of Revelation, it's found because it's like a prophecy but the author already knew that it was going to take place because it already took place. So the author makes believe that he's writing at a time previous to the event. For instance, in the book of Daniel, Daniel is writing as though he is living back at the time of the Babylonian captivity. In reality, Daniel is living much later. So what happens is he writes about something's happened in the past as though he's living in the past. He's foretelling what's going to happen because it has happened. He knows it. So he makes believe he's before that event and he tells the story. So the same thing happens in any book of Revelation. It's something written down if there's historical ideas in there. Now there are other ideas that are meant to be applied to the people in the life in which they're living right now. So when the author writes these particular ideas, 
he's writing for an audience in a form of code. Christians, Jewish Christians, they'll be able to recognize some of the code very easily because they're familiar with the Old Testament. So we keep in mind the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what might happen soon. So he's not saying, well, this is what's going to happen in history. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Very often we'll see certain um, applications to present era. For instance, going back to some of the wars that we had, people said, well, you know, it must be the end. The end is going to happen because it's predicted in the scripture. Wars happened. We're still here to talk about it. So it wasn't an apocalyptic prediction of the end. But some preachers made it that they pulled people into, we have to get to church. We have to be prepared because the book of Revelation is being fulfilled. That wasn't true. So we shouldn't read it that way. We're meant to read it and say, what does it mean for us today? So he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. John. Who is John? Very often some of the earlier writers, they would identify John as the writer of John, the gospel writer. But actually, it wasn't John the one who wrote the gospel, nor was it the one who wrote the letters of John. As I mentioned last week, there was a Joanine community. John the Apostle is apparently the source of of this community. He, he shared a message. Others heard the message. It was a very wide school. They picked up the message. They shared the message with each other. And then some came along and they wrote in the spirit of John. And so what it means is it's not John the apostle. It's somebody who belonged to the Joanine community many decades later. So what happened is he made it known by sending his angels to his servant, John, whoever John is here, who gives witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ by reporting what he saw. What he saw, not with his eyes, but what he saw through inspiration. Blessed is the one who reads aloud and blessed are those who listen to the prophetic message and heed what is written in it, for the appointed time is near. So blessed. There are several times when there's a blessed found in the book of Revelation. So this is one of the first blessed. There's about seven of them. Seven, the perfect number. The number seven will come up often. When speaking about perfection, the book of Revelation will use the number seven. And right away, a reader who understands the code or how it's written, will recognize we're now speaking about perfection. So we have a greeting. John, to the seven churches in Asia. Perfection. Seven churches. Seven also represented universal. The seven churches in Asia. Asia Minor. Very often back in those days where the faith was being spread, He's writing to a universal church represented by the churches in Asia Minor, somewhere around Turkey today. But he's writing to these churches. Churches. When he says churches, he means communities. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. From God. He is, he was, he always existed, and he always will continue to exist and from the seven spirits before his throne. The seven spirits. This represents the seven churches, the seven communities. And actually what it comes down to is there's a unity there, but at the same time, seven, the perfect number. When he talks about this is a message for the seven churches, it means it's a message for a universal church. So it's for everybody not just for those particular churches, although each one will be spoken to individually, it will also be something, a message that is saying to the whole church, 
this is what we must be careful of. This is what's going to happen. So from Jesus Christ, the first faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of earth. To him who loves us and has freed us, Jesus brought salvation. Freed us from our sins by his blood, who has made us into a kingdom priest for his God, for his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever. Amen. Little, they call it doxology. A little praise of God right at the beginning. And so we see John received this message. The message is for the universal church. Praise be God. Behold, he is coming on the clouds of heaven, Jesus. And every eye will see him and those who pierced him. All the people of the earth will lament him. Again, in those days, they pictured the earth as being flat. He'd be coming upon the clouds of heaven, so he's riding a chariot. And everybody will see him, because it's a flat earth, everybody's looking. But again, symbolic. The earth is round. Somehow we'll experience God's presence. But not with the idea of riding on the clouds, but this is the way the author would express it for us. So, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Then John talks about the first vision. So that was kind of a little introduction, a greeting. I, John, your brother, who share with you the distress, the kingdom, and the endurance we have in Jesus, found myself on the island called Patmos. The island Patmos. Back in those days when Rome invaded, they would send many of their captives to islands in the Aegean Sea. And John is on this island. It's an island of exile, actually. It's a penal colony. So John is there at the penal colony. And so John is saying, I find myself here because I proclaim God's word and gave testimony to Jesus. He said, I began to share God's word, began to preach about Jesus. And so for that reason, Rome exiled him to this island in Patmos. I was caught, in, caught up in the spirit on the Lord's Day, Sunday, and heard behind me a voice as loud as a trumpet. When God visits Moses on the mountain, his voice is like a trumpet. God's voice comes across like a trumpet, and it's a symbolic idea. He's having a visitation from the Lord. So John is experiencing this visitation. And this voice said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thracia, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. Lampstands were in the temple in Jerusalem. Here they're symbolic again. They represent the seven churches, which in turn represent the universal church. One like the Son of Man, wearing an ankle-length robe with a gold sash around his chest. So in the middle of it, stands this person like the son of man, like a human being. And he has a white robe on. He has a sash around his waist. The hair of his head is as white as white wool or as snow. In the Old Testament, we read about God as the ancient one. Jesus also, symbolically, is one who always existed. So it happens now. His feet were like polished brass. His eyes were like fiery flame. He can see everything. 
fiery flame, alive. Feet like polished brass, symbolically the strength. There's no further any changes. This is change. He's solidly there. And his voice was like the sound of rushing water. An image from the Old Testament, where they speak about God's voice as sounding like rushing water. So he's saying, this is God. What I saw in my vision was an image of God. He pulls together many of the apocalyptic images of God found in the Old Testament. A sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth, and his face shone like the sun at its brightest. Two-edged sword, knows everything, cuts every way. Nothing gets away from its sharpness, and nothing can say, well, let's just cut in one direction. It's, it's total. So it, it cuts the hearts of everybody, cuts into the hearts of all people. His face shone like the sun, symbolically saying he is in eternal glory. It shone like the sun. So right away, we have symbolic beginnings. We get an image of someone standing in the middle of seven lampstands. And the lampstands, as I said, represents the churches. He's going to write these letters now to these churches. But he talks now about the man, Jesus. When I caught sight of him, I fell down at his feet as though dead. So it's the glorified Jesus, the Son of Man, seen in a sense in his human way of life, but still glorious way of life. He touched me with his right hand and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. He's there from the beginning or before the beginning and will last on into eternity. He's the Alpha, first letter Greek Latin, alphabet, and the Omega. So he says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the one who lives. So he's saying, God lives, Jesus lives. Once I was dead, but now I am alive forever and ever. He died physically. He was crucified. But now in his resurrection, he lives forever and ever. I hold the keys to death in the netherworld. So he's the judge. He holds the keys to death. Death happens in the netherworld. The netherworld is the, the abode of the dead. Write down, therefore, what you have seen and what is happening and what will happen afterwards. This has led many preachers to simply take the word, liter the words literally and see it as simply something very literal and talking about the future. But that's not what is happening here. He's saying, prepare yourselves, be prepared within yourselves for what happens. This is the secret meaning of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands, seven stars. The idea of the seven stars, universal dominion. He holds the seven stars symbolized by angels sometimes. But the idea behind that, it's a dominion, the seven. Again, the perfect number, seven. And the seven gold lampstands, the perfect number seven. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Lampstands are the churches. The stars are the angels over each church. And the seven lampstands, as he says, are the seven churches. Right away, we know we're in the midst of apocalyptic writing. We're in the midst of highly symbolic writing. It has a meaning. It has a meaning for the people of its own day, and even an application to our day. But we have to get behind it. We don't take it literally. If we take it literally, we don't understand it. So we have to get behind, understand the people, the writing, and what the author really is trying to say to us. So now we have a series of seven letters. Some would call the letter Revelation a letter. It's really the book of Revelation. 
it really isn't a letter. There are seven letters right at the beginning, but that mode of literature changes after these seven letters sent to these different communities. So to the angel of church at Ephesus, write this. So he's telling him, write this down. The one who holds the seven stars in his hands, dominion, and walks in the midst of the seven gold lampstands in the midst of the community, the universal community. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, that you cannot tolerate the wicked. You have tested those who call themselves apostles, but aren't the apostles, and discovered they are imposters. So he's writing to the people of Ephesus. Ephesus was a main trade center. In fact, the seven letters go to the seven trade centers in Asia Minor. It's like Ephesus, a very important, the capital actually in that area. And around him, almost like a, a circle of the other churches, the other, other places where the churches exist. You have endurance and have suffered in my name, Ephesus. And you have not grown weary to the people, to the people of the church of Ephesus, but to all people. You've really had to endure a great deal. Yet despite your endurance, I hold this against you. You have lost the love you had at first. Realize how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So he's saying the people, they have to keep their faith up. They have to endure in the midst of persecution. Otherwise, there will no longer be that church at Ephesus. But you have this in your favor. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans. The idea, they're the people who come. They've taken Christianity, but they've tried to meld it in with pagan practices. And this happens even today. We try to water down the word of God, make it fit in the modern world, which is not bad. However, don't make it fit with sinful tendencies found in the modern world. So what happened was they tried to bring this into their life, but they were bringing it into their life with pagan practices. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the Spirit speaking to the churches so that whoever has ears, it doesn't mean, of course, we have physical ears. It means the ability to hear. People say things to us, and what's really important for us is, are we ready to hear it? There are things said in this world, as we know, that people aren't ready to hear and when someone tells them something from God, they're right away objecting in their own mind. To the victor, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. That is from the garden of God, the tree of life. So remember, there were two trees in the garden of paradise in that story. It was the tree of life and then the tree of good and evil. The tree of life, that was from God. That was living with God, the tree of life. And so that, per, that God is saying, I'm going to give those who are faithful the ability to live with this tree of life to you. So the universal church. Then he writes to the church at Smyrna. The first and last who once died but came to life says this. Excuse me. I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who claim to be Jews and are not, but rather are members of the assembly of Satan. When he speaks about Jews, he's speaking about those who are faithful to God's message. He's not speaking necessarily about the nation of Judaism, but basically those who take God's message and live it. Do not be afraid of anything that you're going to suffer. Indeed, the devil will throw some of you into prison and you will face an ordeal, an ordeal for 10 days. 
So he's saying, don't be afraid of sufferings. Again, the universal church, not just the church at Smyrna, although this is to Smyrna. He's saying in the universal church, you're going to suffer. Remain faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. So it's meant to be an encouragement. One of the overall ideas of the book of Revelation, actually, it's meant to be a book of hope and a book of encouragement. God is in, in charge. No matter what happens, it's only because God allows it. And so God is always in charge. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The victor shall not be harmed by the second death. The victor, the one who conquers, the one who's faithful. Second death, what the second death is, we die, of course, physically. But the second death is con condemnation. Condemnation into eternal death. And so when they say death, they mean the idea of being cut off from God. And so in eternity without God, second death. <clears throat> then to Pergamum, third letter. To the, to the angel of the church of Pergamum, write this. The one with the sharp two-edged sword says, I know that you live where Satan's throne is, and yet you hold fast to my name and have not denied your faith in me. Not even in the days of Antipas, the my faithful witness, who is martyred among you where Satan lives. So he says, you remain faithful even when things were bad, even when a major person was, was killed. You still remain faithful. You didn't, it didn't turn you against me in the sense of saying, well, now I'm afraid I'm going to turn against God rather than be killed. You have some people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, however, bad things. Balaam was uh, a god, really a pagan god. And there were worshipers, people who worshiped this pagan god. And so he's saying there are some who worship this god. It comes from the Old Testament. He instructed Balak to put a stumbling block before the Israelites. So the idea that happened back in the Old Testament. Balak was coming to help the Israelites really at first, but then he was persuaded to turn against them, to eat food sacrificed to idols, and to play the harlot. Playing the harlot, that simply means to go to another god. It's the idea of being spiritually saying, you have the one true god. When you go to another god, you're as though you're a harlot. So he's saying that, be careful of that. You have some people who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. He said, um, that's again, something that is really abhorrent to God. So repent. Otherwise, I will come to you quickly and wage war with them with the sword of my mouth. God's word, two-edged sword, will now overcome them. The word of his mouth. The word of his mouth is God's word. Two-edged sword, cuts all ways, controls everything in the world. And so that's what he's saying there. Again, whoever, whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the victor, I will give some of the hidden manna, the refreshment, the helpful life, spiritual nourishment. So to the victor, those who are faithful. I will also give a white amulet upon which is inscribed a new name, which no one knows except the one who receives it. Back in those days, you had these secret amulets. And they believed that if you had this, you were protected by that person. And so he's saying, I've given this person the secret way of protection. Now he goes to Thyatira, another place. To the angel, write this. The son of God, whose eyes are like fiery flames, and whose feet are like polished brass, says this. I know your works, your love, faith, service, and endurance, and that your last works 
are greater than the first. Yet I hold this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, who teaches and misleads my servants to play the harlot and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Eating food sacrificed to idols, symbolically what that meant in those days, when you ate that food, you were praising the idols by doing it. Jezebel. Jezebel is from the Old Testament. She was one who was trying to kill Elijah. She was one who could influence the king. She was married to the king and a person of great influence, a sinful person. And it says that Jezebel, it means someone now or people now who act like Jezebel and who lead them into sin, who misleads them and leads them into the idea of playing the harlot. Again, playing the harlot, accepting gods, other gods than the one true God. I've given her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her harlotry. So God is saying to that community, many of you have sinned. You've turned to this other idea, the other gods, the idols. And I've given you time, but you haven't accepted it. So I will cast her on a sickbed and plunge those who commit adultery with her into intense suffering unless they repent of their works. So they're going to have intense suffering. So what God is saying here is the idea being is that it's not just this world, it's really the eternal world, the beginning and the end. They'll have great suffering. But I say to the rest of you, who do not uphold this teaching and know nothing of the so-called deep secrets of Satan, on you I place a further burden, except that you must hold fast to what you have. The burden is to remain faithful, even when Satan, with all God's power, all Satan's power, is trying to overcome God. But Satan can't overcome God. So we have a little phrase here, a poem. To the victor who keeps my words until the end, I will give authority over the nations, spiritual authority. Not make that person a king in the sense of a worldly king, material king. He will rule them with an iron rod. Like clay vessels will they be smashed. Jesus will rule with an iron rod. The message of Jesus. Just as I received authority from my father, to him, I will give the morning star. The morning star, resurrection. I will give him the power of resurrection, my resurrection. So the power of the resurrected Christ. Whoever has ears to hear or to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, what he's saying here is, I've called you, you've abandoned me, now I want you back. If you come back, I will bless you. I will always be with you. But if you do not, then you're going down to the netherworld, into the grave, into a world below, a second death. A second death means eternal death. Then he writes to the people of Sardis, another letter. The one who has the seven spirits of God and the Seven stars says this. In other words, Jesus says this. I know your works, that you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen what is left, or which is going to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then, how you accepted and heard. Keep it and repent. Remind yourself of the word of God in your life. If you are not watchful, I will come like a thief, and you will never know at what hour. A message continually repeated in the Gospels, not knowing what hour. The people of Sardis, he's saying, be always prepared. Don't think, well, I'll, I'll be prepared when the time comes, when I see it coming near. 
I'm coming at an hour you least expect. You have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me dressed in white, symbol of purity, white. They'll be pure in the sense, not just, it, again, sexual purity, but totally in the mind, dedicated to God. Everything they do is good. They have concern for others because they are worthy. That's why they have the white robes on. The victor will thus be dressed in white. And I will never erase that person's name from the book of life, but will acknowledge that person in the presence of God the Father and of his angels. So the one who remains faithful is the victor, the one whom God will, or Jesus will, recognize. Now he writes another letter to the Church of Philadelphia. Not modern-day Philadelphia, of course. It's the name of a place in Ulta in the early church. To the angel of the Church of Philadelphia, write this. The Holy One, the True, who holds the key of David. The key of David. He's an offspring of the, offspring of the tribe of David. So he belongs to the line of David. Who opens and no one shall close. Once Jesus' message comes into the world, he opens that, he opens God's message to the world. It's always there, it's always going to be there. No matter what happens in the world, it will always be God's message that people must confront. Who closes and no one shall open. So every now and then, we see where God is giving a blessing and really rejecting evil, and no one's going to bring it back. God has power over evil. Evil does not have power over God. I know your works, he says to the church in Philadelphia, really the universal church. Behold, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. Christ's word is now in the world. It will always be in the world. It's there for people to accept. Those who know it, receive it. Those who don't yet know it, with the grace of God, can find this open door. You have limited strength, and yet you have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the assembly of Satan, who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying, Behold, I will make them come and fall prostrate at your feet, and they will realize that I love you. What he's saying here is that he's going to remain faithful to the church that remains faithful. Eventually, those who are unfaithful will have to succumb and recognize that no matter how they turned against God or rejected God, they will finally realize they can't win they'll always be at the feet of the believers in that sense. Because you have been kept my message of endurance, I will keep you safe in the time of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test all the inhabitants of the earth. So right away we begin to get the idea is something great going to happen at the end? Keeping in mind, we're talking about symbolic language. I'm coming to you quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may take your crown. Jesus said, I'm coming to you quickly, right away. But I'm giving you the strength so no one can take away that crown, that victor crown of faithfulness to God. The victor I will make into a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will never leave it again. God is building this heavenly temple. The victor, those who are faithful, all of us, we're part of that building of God's temple. We're building the heavenly temple. The heavenly temple is made up of Christ, God, Holy Spirit, but all of us, all of us are part of that heavenly temple. On that person who remains faithful, I will inscribe the name of my God in the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem, 
which comes down from heaven from my God, as well as my new name. So the imagery there, it's an image again. It is a new Jerusalem, a place of peace, love, coming down from heaven. They believed everything existed up there in heaven. No idea of the universe. They just saw the earth as simply being heaven, earth, the underworld. That was their image of the world. So we have a different image today. We say come down from heaven, we mean come from heaven. Heaven is a place of spiritual spirit in the sense of saying when we say spiritual, we're saying spirit, a spirit world. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To Laodicea, another letter. To the angel of the churches, church at Laodicea. Yea, men, Jesus, the faithful and true witness, the source of God's creation, says this, to creator. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So this is what the creator says, Jesus. I know your works. I know that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. It's kind of a calmer translation they used to have. The older translation used to say, I'll vomit you up. Something lukewarm. So it's something that is not able to be taken lukewarm. It should be cold or hot. But when it's lukewarm, it, it's sickening. For you say, I am rich and affluent and have no need of anything. And yet I do not realize that you are wretched. And at the same time, I am wretched. So what that person's saying is, I'm rich. I have everything. I'm wretched. Pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Actually, that person has nothing. So what Jesus is saying to him, you don't realize that. You don't realize you're wretched. You have nothing. You think you have everything. But if you don't have God, you have nothing. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. Spiritual sense. Not, not gold, we're not going to be rich in gold, but the idea being the gold, the spiritual. Take it so that you may be rich and white garments to put on that cover your shameful nakedness so that you may not be exposed. So clothe yourself in the white garments of those who are faithful to God to the end, no matter what happens. And buy ointment to smear on your eyes that you may see. Buy. Give yourself over to it. Your whole being buys into it. That's the idea behind that buy. Those whom I love, I reprove and chastise. God wants people to be faithful no matter what they have to go through. It's a proof of their love for God. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will enter the house and dine with him and be with him and he with me. I will give the victor the right to sit with me on my throne. And I myself first won the victory and sit with my father on his throne. So we'll all be together, sharing in the eternal throne of God. Sitting on the throne means the idea of being picture many chairs says about we have to use our human imagination. But actually it's it's very weak in what the reality is. We don't know what the reality is. But somehow we're going to share in the throne the power of God. That's a symbol of throne. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the seventh letter, the last one. The idea behind these letters is simply saying we're living in a world of persecution. There's reasons that God praises those who are faithful 
and reasons that God warns those who are not faithful. There are those who are faithful, but at the same time have to be very careful because Satan is trying to grasp them, trying to change them, trying to lead them in a different direction. So basically, that's the first seven letters, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Chapter four, the book of Revelation continues. After this, the author John says, I had a vision of an open door in heaven, and I heard the trumpet-like voice that had spoken to me before, saying, come up here, and I will show you what must happen afterwards. At once, I was caught up in spirit. It's not a bodily raising of himself. His spirit is what is caused, Paul called up. So the idea, his spirit is what's going to experience this. And he's saying it's a spiritual experience. It's a revelation. A throne was there in heaven. And on the throne sat one whose appearance, whose appearance sparkled like Jasper and Chameleon. Around the throne was a halo as brilliant as an emerald. Surrounding the throne... 24 other thrones on which 24 elders sat dressed in white garments with gold crowns on their heads. Symbolism. The symbolism here is he sees the throne of God and now he sees these 24 elders. And what that symbolizes is the Old and New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are 12 tribes of Israel. In the New Testament, 12 apostles. And so 24 elders sitting around in glory. So they have white gold crowns on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightnings, trumblings, and peals of thunder. God. God the powerful. Seven flaming torches burned in front of the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The idea, seven torches, again, seven, the perfect number. Seven spirits of God seems to be a reference to the angels. In front of the throne was something that resembled a sea of glass like crystal. In ancient times, they pictured the earth as having the underworld, the earth here, but then heaven. And in heaven, God sat over something like water, but it looked like glass, a glassy image as though God was sitting at a place where, it was, where we had glass underneath everything. So the sea was like glass. In front of the throne was something that resembled a sea of glass, like crystal. In the center and around the throne, there were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and back. Four living creatures, angels, eyes in front and back. They could see everything. And so the idea, again, the message, the symbolism. The first creature resembled a lion. The second was like a calf. The third had a face like that of a human being. And the fourth looked like an eagle in flight. So resembled a lion, power. The second resembled a calf. It can either be the idea of offering, or it can also be symbolizing power, the ox. The third had a face like that of a human being, wisdom. The fourth like that of an eagle in flight, flight, fastness, speed. In the early church, they began to apply these images to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John. So, for instance, the first one, lion, Matthew. Then the second, the calf, Mark. Third, um, we can say, well, the third then would be the face of a human being and the fourth like that of an eagle. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, were covered with eyes inside and out. Day and night, they do not stop exclaiming, Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is 
and who is to come. They're in this heavenly world, spiritual world. There is no need to sleep. Day and night, they praise God. And so we have these four creatures, these four angels, who are always praising God. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, the Old Testament and the New Testament, fall down before the one who sits on the throne and worship him, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Symbolism. The Old Testament, New Testament, always given to worshiping God. And that's the symbolism again. Always given to worshiping God. They throw down their crowns before the throne. They, they, when they come before the throne, they recognize the true ruler. And they take off their crowns. Because their crowns, they no longer are crowned before the great person, the great ruler. Worthy are you, Lord our God, they exclaim. For you created all things. Because of your will, they came to be and were created. So they're praising God this way. God is the creator of all things. Because of God, they came to be. Chapter 5. Then John says, I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. It had writing on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. In those days, whenever they did something, sent a message, they would put a little piece of wax there and they would have a signet ring. And they would seal that ring. They would seal that writing with their ring. Especially rulers. If someone took their place and they wanted that person to send something out, they would let the person take that ring to seal something, a message. Then I saw a mighty angel who proclaimed in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Who is worthy to read this, to really see what God is sending to the world? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to examine it. One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. A lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, enabling him to open the scroll with the seven seals. The lion of Judah. Jesus comes from the lion of Judah. He's called the Lion of Judah. He's also the root of David. He comes from, again, David's offspring. He's triumphed through his passion, death, he's triumphed. That enables him, Jesus, to open the scroll with his seven seals. Then I saw standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb, it seems to have been slain. We had the image of Jesus, the lamb, who was slain. Like an innocent lamb, he is led to the slaughter. And so he's led to the slaughter. And so he has seven horns and seven eyes. Perfect. And these are the seven spirits of God sent out to the whole world. So God sends out the spirits from Jesus. He came and received the scroll from the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. Took the scroll from God, the Father. When he took it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. So imagery again, trying to understand how can the lamb grab a scroll? We don't worry about that. We don't try to make everything fit. Each of the elders held a, shah, a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the holy ones, symbolizing even the harp, heavenly music. So that's when you picture someone in heaven having a harp. And then incense, gold bowls filled with incense. And so they sang a new hymn. Worthy are you to receive the scroll and break open its seals. 
For you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God those of every tribe and tongue, people and nation. Jesus. Jesus was worthy to receive the scroll and break open its seals. For Jesus was slain, and with the Jesus' blood, he purchased from God tribes of every tongue and nation, people of all the whole world. So basically saying, he now has the power. He has died for us. He is now raised for us. He can now open the seals. The message for the readers, the message for those who are suffering, is that they're going to know through Jesus how to understand God's message in their life. I looked again and heard the voices of many angels who surrounded the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They were countless in number and they cried out in a loud voice. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessing. So Jesus is worthy of all this praise the heavenly hosts all together cry that out. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and everything in the universe cry out to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessings and honor, glory and might forever and ever. It's a doxology in a sense. We pray, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. This is a way of saying in another way, glory be to the one who sits on the throne, to God, and to the one who opened the seal, to Jesus. Keeping in mind the idea behind this book of Revelation, John was writing it for the suffering Christians in Rome. They were being persecuted. He wanted to send a message to them. He's on the island of Patmos, hoping that this message can get to them. So it's going to happen. He's going to send this message in symbolic, apocalyptic language. If others were to pick it up and not have a knowledge of apocalyptic language, they wouldn't really understand what the message was. But what John is saying here in his message is that what's going to happen is that God is in control. And the one who has broken open the seal, who really has brought blessings upon the world, that's Jesus Christ. And you in Rome who are suffering such a difficult thing, realize Jesus Christ has opened up the door to knowledge of God's presence in the world today. And once you enter that door, you're going to have to suffer. God will chastise you in the sense but you don't just suffer for the sake of suffering. You suffer for the message, for the love of God. So after they say to the one who sits on the throne, be blessing, honor, glory, and forever and ever, the four living creatures, those who are looking throughout the whole world, and amen. And the elders, Old Testament, New Testament, in Christ, fall down and worshiped. So what happens in this first part, the first five chapters of the book of Revelation, we see where God is speaking to all churches through a writer who accepts the name of John. His name is John, he's on an island, he's in exile, but he's writing not a letter, but really a book. It begins with letters, seven letters, perfect number, to the universal church. But then he begins to speak about the Lamb of God, the one who is worthy to open up the scroll and bring us more revelation. So the scrolls are going to bring us revelation. So now, as we continue to read through the book of Revelation, we continue to learn what is contained in these seven scrolls. And so that we will continue with the next time we come together to say, what do these seven scrolls tell us? Good news, bad news? We'll find out as we continue on through the book of Revelation.
May the light of Christ lead me. The power of Christ be with me. The wisdom of Christ inspire me. The word of Christ instruct me. The shelter of Christ protect me. The hand of Christ hold me. And the love of Christ be with me. May the grieving find support in me. The sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.